Well, our text this morning is Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 22, and if you would stand in honor of God's word as we read, I've asked if Amanda Marriage would come and read for us. Acts chapter 4. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread to no, other, no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak of what we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people. For all were praising God for what they had for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than forty years old. Thank you, Amanda. Would you pray with me, Church? Lord God of heaven and earth, who made all things and through whom all things hold together, Lord, would you bless the preaching of your word <clears throat> through the illumination of the Holy Spirit and by the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Well, last Sunday, I issued a challenge to become passionate about sharing the gospel. I asked, why not a a adopt the attitude of our feline friends. Why not? Five times per year to 20 people at a time. Can you imagine the exponential growth of the kingdom of God if we would just adopt that attitude? And this morning, I'm going to answer the natural follow-up question. The question would be, what if I do? What if I do become feline passionate about the gospel? What if I become a true evangelist? How will people respond? And what's the worst thing that could happen to me? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that God decided to use the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 22 says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called the power and wisdom of God. I hope you caught that. I believe, and I think the scriptures teach, that there are three possible responses to the preaching of the gospel. When you have an opportunity to share the good news with your neighbor over the backyard fence, and at some point, he or she shares their new age perspective on the world, and you say respectfully, no, that system won't work. You're going to die in your sin unless you repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness in Jesus' name. I know that some of us get sweaty palms just thinking about saying something like that. But we know that the only reason we can say something like that is because we have loved our neighbors so well. We took them food when their wives had surgery and 
help them to shovel their driveway over and over and over and remember to take out their trash cans for them when they forgot. And so we are earning the right to say the truth. We know that when we do that, our neighbors will do one of three things. They will either get horribly offended, and probably not invite you to the next block Christmas party, or they're going to write you off as crazy. And this, I find, is the most frequent response that I get. That's kind of a grin and a smile, maybe a rolling of their eyes, right? Like, yeah, Danny, I know that's what you think. Oh, it's kind of like we do toward people who are very kind, but dim-witted, <laughs> you know, just a nod and a smile. Or they're going to ponder your message, believe, and be saved. What's interesting about the book of Acts is that we see all three of these responses put into play as the book focus shifts from Jews to Gentiles, from Peter to the Apostle Paul, we see the responses to their messages shift as well. The Jews at the beginning of the book, and we notice this morning, even become horribly offended. They start making arrests. They start beating people up and scolding them, commanding them to be silent. The Gentiles just kind of nod along politely, rolling their eyes right at these dim-witted people who actually believe that a man raised from the dead. But others throughout the book have their hearts touched by the Spirit of God, and they believe, and so they join the movement. And we're going to focus this morning on the first of those responses, when the Jewish ruling class becomes horribly offended and decides to put faith in Christ on trial. And to this point in our Acts study, the gospel has been allowed to spread relatively unencumbered in Jerusalem from the crucifixion until this morning. The last several months, the gospel has just continued to spread. But things turn, we notice in chapter 4, when for the very first time ever, the church experiences persecution. And ironically, it's for having compassion on a man who couldn't walk. <laughs> Why this persecution? Because a man born lame was healed. He was given his legs back. And I guarantee he was not pressing charges, <laughs> right? And yet the two apostles who performed that miracle in Jesus' name are brought before the Sanhedrin, brought before the Israeli Supreme Court, if you want to think of it that way, for healing a man? Probably not. It was really because of what they believed about the powerful name of Jesus. From that day, from Acts chapter 4 until this day, the church has been persecuted on and off. And sometimes it's been mild. Other times that persecution has been exacted with extreme prejudice. For 2,000 years, the church has been tolerated at best. But there have always been efforts to exterminate the people of God, all with the goal of shutting us up. For instance, in the third century, we're talking about 1,800 years ago, a certain Christian priest was decapitated for his faith. The Roman Empire at the time was being invaded by the barbarian Goths, and although the strength of the Roman army would normally have put down such rebellions with ease, smallpox was also making its way through the empire, killing as many as 5,000 Roman citizens per day, and it was depleting Rome's ability to make war. Now, believing that single men fought more fiercely than married men, the emperor at the time, Emperor Claudius, banned marriage among Roman soldiers. But this certain Christian priest disobeyed the emperor's edict by secretly marrying young soldiers to their brides. When the emperor Claudius found out, he arrested the priest, he brought him to Rome, imprisoned him, and sentenced him to death. And while awaiting his execution, young couples whom he had married would often visit. They were passing him notes and flowers through the bars as symbols of their gratitude. While imprisoned, the priest just started sharing the gospel with anybody who would listen, including the judge who had sentenced him. The judge's response after hearing the gospel was to ask the priest to prove the validity of his message. He said, I have a daughter who is blind. If you will heal her in Jesus' name, then I'll know that your message is true. And so he brought his blind daughter before the priest. The priest laid hands on this young lady and prayed, and she was instantly healed. That still imprisoned priest and the judge's young daughter fell in love not long after. The priest's name was Valentinus. The evening before his execution, on the evening of February 13th, the priest passed the young lady a note declaring his love for her, which was signed at the bottom from 
your valentine. The next day, February 14th, St. Valentine was beheaded. And so this coming Wednesday, when somebody gives you a note signed, be my valentine, politely refuse. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I think I'm good. <laughs> I like my head where it is. <clears throat> Christians have always been persecuted. This shouldn't be any surprise to us since Christ said this would happen. He was so clear. He said, if people are going to persecute me, they are going to persecute you. In John chapter 15 and verse 18, he said, if the world hates you, don't forget. They hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But you're not of the world. I called you out of the world. And don't forget, a servant will not be greater than its master if they persecuted me. They will also persecute you. And this persecution persists because Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, and the ruler of the spiritual powers of darkness, even more specifically, the ruler over the powers which govern this fallen culture. Yes, even in a Christian nation, that persecution persists because that Satan is after, always after those who genuinely profess Christ. If you stand with Christ in the gospel, then you have an enemy of your soul who is against you. And toward those who are indifferent toward their souls, Satan responds with indifference. In other words, if you don't care about your soul, then Satan doesn't either, right? But toward those who have their gazes fixed upon Christ, and on eternity, he has nothing but scorn and wrath. And he will use any means at his disposal to bring you to harm and to shut your professing mouth. The enemy, after all, did everything in his power to shut Christ up. And if we align ourselves with him, we should probably expect the same treatment. There may come a day when we are questioned about where we stand and with whom. And the question I'm going to have kind of throughout the sermon this morning is, are you ready for that day? Are you ready to stand with Christ and his gospel? And in our text this morning, the apostles, Peter and John, but really the apostle Peter does all the talking. They make it abundantly clear where they stand and with whom, who they stand with. They offer, if you want to think of it this way, like a master class on what to do when faith gets put on trial. And so allow me to give us some context, beginning in verse one. It says, as they were speaking to the people, right? You remember from last week, that miracle had been done. As they're talking, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Imagine the crowd that must have gathered after Peter and John healed such a famous man. Now, this man was not famous for any other reason than that he had been sitting in the same place day after day for many years, possibly even decades. And it was a prominent place. It was on their way to the temple to worship. Everybody in the city at some point knew who this man was because they'd been confronted by the broken, broken beggar. Now, most of the time, the guy wouldn't even make eye contact. But at some point on their way to worship, this man had asked them for a few copper coins. And now the same guy is standing and leaping and shouting and praising. And in such a commotion, the temple authorities were notified and their appearance was even sudden. In fact, you may be holding a translation that uses the word suddenly, suddenly the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Their presence was covert. They had gone unnoticed until they suddenly busted in and they started putting people in handcuffs. Their titles are listed in an interesting order. It says the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, the combination of the priests along with their captain probably means that these were not your normal everyday run-of-the-mill priests who happened to be on duty Luke uses an interesting word to describe these same priests and their captain in his gospel, the gospel of Luke, when these same guys came to arrest Jesus in the garden. Except in that instance, he uses the word underlings. In its context, it had a very negative connotation. You can think of these underling priests like a Levitical police force who literally went around with clubs 
doing the bidding of the high priest. They were his thugs, okay? That's these priests, right? Not the nice guys who were sacrificing lambs. These guys literally carried around billy clubs ready to do the dirty work that the high priest didn't want to do himself. They were his muscle, all right? Uh, their boss, who was the captain, was the man responsible for temple security. He was always chosen from one of the aristocratic chief priestly families. In terms of succession, he was next in line to the high priest himself. If the high priest had keeled over, the captain would normally take his place. He was next in line to the high priesthood. Now, the Sadducees were the Jewish sect who controlled the temple precinct. They also controlled the captain of the temple. They told him what to do. And they wanted to keep the peace in Jerusalem at any cost since they were in cahoots with the Roman government and they were making a killing off of the sacrificial system Pun intended, okay? No one? Got it? Hallie got it. Killing and sacrificial. Now notice, that won't be the last one, so prepare your hearts. Uh, notice, specifically, what it was that they objected to, okay? Why were they so upset? Look at verse 2. They were greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, <laughs> They were greatly annoyed, not at the miracle, but at the message, and specifically, what about the message? See the word resurrection? The resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees denied the idea of a bodily resurrection, and so they were Sadducee. <laughs> that is way worse. <laughs> yeah, this is way worse. <laughs> They also denied miracles. Can you imagine? They're in charge of the temple. They're in charge of sacrifices. And yet they deny resurrection. They deny the miraculous. They denied anything supernatural. They denied the existence of angels. And this wasn't the first time that they had run into a conflict with Jesus and his message. Do you remember it was the Sadducees who came to Jesus one day and said, Rabbi, there was a certain woman. Do you remember this? Her husband died and married the brother and his had died and married the brother and they died. And it's seven times, Lord, seven times she marries these guys. They all die. Well, at the resurrection, when she goes to heaven, whose wife will she be? Remember them asking? It was the Sadducees who asked him that. And he responds simply by saying, that's not how it works in heaven. You don't know anything. <laughs> what are you talking about? You don't even believe in heaven. You're just trying to trap me. That's not how it works. They didn't like Jesus. And so they didn't, by extension, like his followers either. And Peter had just performed an undeniable miracle. They didn't even believe that miracles exist. And yet hundreds of people had witnessed this thing. Massive crowd and began preaching about sin and forgiveness and prophets and spiritual restoration and a resurrection from the dead. This would be like the Sadducee perfect storm. Okay, that's what's happening here in Acts chapters three and four. So what do they do? Look at verse three. They arrested them, Peter and John. And put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. They handcuffed them, they jailed them, hoping, no doubt, that in their absence, if we just take Peter and John out, the crowd will disperse, the storm will die down. But did it work? No. The very first word of verse 4 is such a tell. Okay, what's the first word of verse 4? But... But in that one word, you can see the hopes of the Sadducees, right? The hopes in that arrest. Our hope was that this is just all going to go away. Verse 4 says, but many of those who had heard the word, the word from Acts chapter 3, had seen the miracle, had heard about restoration, had heard about reconciliation with God, had heard, right? You are the sons of these prophets. You, you, you need to believe what, what Moses preached in Deuteronomy. You need to believe this prophet Jesus has come and we need to believe in his name. The many of those who had heard that word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, the last number we were given at the end of chapter two was 3,000. Do you remember that? In Acts chapter 1, it was 120. In Acts chapter 2, at the end of Acts chapter 2, it was 3,000 total believers. And now we're given another number, 5,000. But this says specifically 5,000 men. 
We assume that there were women and children as well who probably followed their husbands and fathers' lead in professing Christ. I mean, estimate there somewhere double that, maybe triple that number, 10,000, 12,000 believers. You think about this, all through the night, while Peter and John slept quietly in their jail cell, while the Sadducees all went home thinking they had dodged this storm, they had sidestepped a landmine, all the while they are sleeping peacefully, yet the Spirit was at work. We're reminded of the Apostle Paul's sentiment in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 when he said that although he was imprisoned, do you remember this? The word of God is not bound. Although I am in chains, I am bound. He says the word of God is not bound. And what a great reminder this is that the Lord never slumbers nor sleeps. Amen. He is always at work, even when we are not. You guys remember the story from 2 Kings when King Hezekiah awoke to find King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, his armies destroyed. Do you remember that? That evil Assyrian king Sennacherib had laid waste to many of Jerusalem's suburbs, then laid siege to Jerusalem itself. Sennacherib even bragged that he had shut Hezekiah up like a bird in a cage. Hezekiah received a threatening letter from the king of Assyria, which he took and laid before the Lord in prayer. Remember, he took that letter and he went into the temple, and he laid it down and just began praying like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And the Lord responded to Hezekiah through a prophet saying, the king of Assyria shall not prevail. He shall not shoot an arrow, nor shall he lay a hand on you. And so Hezekiah went to bed. And while he slept, the angel of the Lord struck down Sennacherib's army. 185,000 soldiers, the Bible says, woke up dead. <laughs> Here we see the Spirit of God at work again. The same Spirit of God. While the people of God were sleeping, while the apostles slept, the Spirit of God burst out of the temple, burst into the hearts of men and women. The Sadducees went to sleep thinking they had won, but when they woke... There were thousands more believers, followers of Christ. A spiritual awakening was taking place, which we see they were powerless to stop. And here's where we get to sit under the teaching of the apostles, Peter and John. We get to like register for their master class on what to do when your faith is put on trial. And you might even kind of pull up there and, and say, well, Pastor Danny, can I just stop you for a moment? Are you saying there may come a day when our faith is put on trial the way that their faith was? I mean, come on. There's no way that a Christian nation is going to put Christian faith on trial. And honestly, you may be right. But in the off chance that the politics of our beloved nation and our country's social climate turn against us, wouldn't hurt to be prepared. And so let's just learn from their lessons, okay? Let's sit as students in their class, as Peter and John teach us what to do. If our faith is ever put on trial, what do we do? Lesson number one would be this, don't be offended. Don't be offended, lesson number one. That scan again in your own Bibles, verses one to four. Look at the apostles' angry outbursts. Pay particular attention to their threats, to their claims of violation of their rights. Uh, notice in verses 1 to 4 again, their promises of retribution. Notice their demands for legal counsel. I want to talk to my lawyer. Notice the spitting, the vitriol. Uh, Peter, no doubt, while in handcuffs behind his back and having his head shoved down into that cop car that was shouted back over his shoulder, just wait till my Twitter followers hear what you've done. <laughs> right? They didn't do any of these things. They remained seemingly unoffended. <laughs> like, of course we're going to go to jail. That's what happens to people like us. Now, compared to the remarkable miracle which they had just performed, their arrest was unremarkable and uneventful. Their actions were quite similar, in fact, to the actions of our Savior, who in 1 Peter 2 
says when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And friends, we can do the same on that day if we find ourselves eventually in handcuffs. We can be equally unoffended. And honestly, what has been done to us is nowhere near as what was done to Christ. If we're ever arrested for our faiths, or if we're ever fired for our Christian values, or if we are ever mocked for our views on mar uh, marriage or parenting or gender or sin or any other truth, which the scriptures speak so clearly to, no matter how we are treated by our government, by our employers, by our unsaved family members or neighbors, we too can entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. Because even when there is no justice on earth, we have a heavenly king who is just, and not only just, but merciful and good. We can be unoffended, but notice lesson two. We can adopt the attitude of anywhere, anyone, anytime. Adopt the attitude of anywhere, anyone, anytime. We're going to see in verses five to seven who it was that we, they were being tried by and then what they were being tried for. Anywhere, anyone, anytime. Pick up in verse five. It says, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this? The apostles were being tried by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the 72-member religious ruling court of Israel. Like I said, it was kind of like their supreme court. It was comprised of both Sadducees and Pharisees. And under the supervision of the high priest, they had been allowed by the Roman government to develop their own jurisprudence when it came to matters of the Jewish law. The author does something interesting in verses 5 and 6 by repeating the word and. And I actually even gave that word a little bit of emphasis just to make note of it as we read. He intentionally slows the reader down in order to express the absurdity of this trial. It's like Luke says, you won't believe who was there to interrogate the apostles. You're know, like, well, tell me. The rulers. They're like, well, yeah, that makes sense. And the elders. Like, wait, what? Both? Yeah, and the scribes. <laughs> okay. And Annas, the high priest, and his corrupt father-in-law, Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and the entire high priestly family. I mean, they came out of the woodwork. Now keep in mind, these are the exact same men before whom Jesus had stood and had been convicted. Exact same guys. They had determined that Jesus was deserving of death because in their minds he had committed blasphemy. These were the exact same men who stood by and called for the unjust crucifixion of Jesus and the unjust release of Barabbas. And now Peter and John are going to have an opportunity to confront them. And so let me ask you, church, if you personally had an opportunity to confront Jesus's executioners, are there some things you'd like to say? I mean, a couple of things come to my mind. Here is Peter standing before the crucifiers of not only his best friend, but his best friend who also happened to be the creator of the universe and the savior of all who put their trust in him. And I can imagine Peter wanting to say, oh, just wait. <laughs> He's coming for you. I can almost hear him breaking into a Johnny Cash song, right? There's no inopportune time for Johnny Cash, but <laughs> Peter looking at him and just saying, there's a man going around taking names, <laughs> right? And he's not going to judge everybody all the same. And hear the trumpets, hear the pipers, right? hundred million angels singing. It's Alpha and Omega's kingdom come. There's a man coming around. But that's not what he does. He uses this opportunity to preach the gospel again. 
It's, it's such a crazy example that Peter sets. It's like he just goes limp and just says, you know what, Lord, put me in front of whoever needs to hear the truth. I know I denied you once. That ain't happening again. I've recommitted. I've upped my commitment. Lord, wherever and to whoever and whatever you want me to do, just put me in front of of whoever needs to hear the gospel. And church, shouldn't that be our attitude as well? Lord, anywhere, anyone at any time, if I find myself free, which would be my preference, or imprisoned, fine. If I stay in my neighborhood, which might be my preference, or if you call me to the other side of the world, fine. If I'm with my friends, which would be my preference, or if I'm standing in front of my enemies, fine. I will proclaim your name anywhere to anyone at any time. It was Lieutenant General George Patton, who was the commander of the U.S. Third Army, who famously told Dwight Eisenhower, who was the Allied Supreme Commander. And George Patton, and not necessarily known for being a man of tact, but a great tactician goes to Dwight Eisenhower and just says, you name him and I'll shoot him. And that's the exact sentiment we should bring to the gospel. <laughs> Lord, you name him. I'll shoot him with Jesus. You name him. I'll shoot him. You set him up, Lord. I'll knock him down. It's lesson two. Lesson three, rely upon the spirit of God to tell you what to say. Rely upon the Spirit of God to tell you what to say. Notice in verse 8, then Peter, what is the next phrase? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Now don't skip over this monumental phrase. Christ had told his apostles in Luke 21 and verse 14, settle it therefore in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. And now we see that promise on display. And Peter was so filled with the Spirit that when he opened his mouth, only the Spirit's words poured out. And did you know, church, that we are called to be equally filled? Ephesians 5 and verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Same phrase, we are called to be filled with the Spirit that way. I often drink coffee while I'm driving. This is probably ill-advised. But sometimes my coffee cup, and I only ever drink it hot, I don't understand cold coffee. My coffee cup is sometimes so full that every little bump causes that coffee to spill over. <laughs> right? Onto my lap, into my cup holder, onto my center console, every little bump. And sometimes I'm holding that thing and trying to balance while I'm driving. And in the same way, we should be so filled with the Spirit of God. We, we should be so walking in obedience to his word and rejoicing in his presence that every little bump, every, the, just the tiniest little bump causes the spirit to spill out of us, okay? And so imagine here, Peter filled up to the brim and now he's standing before the Sanhedrin. Notice lesson number four, unashamedly preach the truth regardless of the consequences, unashamedly preach the truth regardless of the consequences. He is filled by the Spirit of God. And now look at what he says, rulers of the people and elders. If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? I'll tell you, is what he's saying. I'll tell you exactly what we did and why. But let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, everybody imagine him pointing at him. <laughs> whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, and has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And as you read Peter's bold gospel presentation, reminding his hearers of the exclusivity of Jesus's salvation offer, that he really is the way and the truth and the life and that no one can come to the Father but through him. You have to assume that Peter thought 
he was about to get executed himself. Right? He hadn't read Acts chapter 5. He he didn't know that they're going to release him. He had no idea. These men had just crucified his best friend three months before. And so now he's standing before the same guys, and he's pointing at those guys, and he's letting them have it. And he has to assume, I'm going to end up on a cross myself. You want to know by whose power and in whose name? You already know the answer. It was by the power of the name of Jesus that this man has been made well. And by the way, there is only one name by which man can be saved. One way, one mediator, and he's got one name. And you know it. Say it with me, Sanhedrin, right? Peter's claim was direct. It was unequivocal. It was unapologetic. And he was ready to go to the cross for it. It was William Temple who was at one point, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who said the gospel is true always and everywhere. Amen? Amen. Or, he said, it's not a gospel at all, or it's not true at all. He continues, the church has become confused and uncertain of its proclamation of the message. And he says, this doesn't make any sense. There's Alistair Begg, who I'm still willing to quote. Our tongues, he says, are so easily tied and our lips quickly sealed either because we lack a thorough knowledge of the gospel or we lack a conviction about the truth of the gospel or in fact, we lack both. He said there's only one reason not to preach the gospel and that's either because you don't know it or you don't believe it. But if you know it and you believe it, then why wouldn't you preach it? And if the gospel really is what we say it is, if it is like Romans 1 and verse 16 says, the power of God for the salvation of all people, then we need not apologize for it. Look down at verse 21. We see the result here. They don't end up on the cross. It says, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 30 years old. When Peter and John were released, and we're going to look at their release next Sunday, they must have been surprised. I really think they thought they were going to be crucified. They had settled that issue in their minds. All the way to the cross, Lord, this is where we will follow you. And they were ready to follow their Savior, forsaking all else. But church, are we? Are we ready to go all the way to the cross? And telling the truth is a tough business in a culture which denies the idea of truth at all. Our culture would tell us that truth is not fixed, it is not absolute, it is not universal. But if we are going to stand up with and for Christ, then we must be willing to endure the same consequences which befell him. But don't forget this promise. Luke chapter 9 and verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him, will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels? We need not be ashamed of the message that we have. And notice finally, last, lesson number five, refuse to stop. Refuse to stop. Look at verse 13. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished because they had been with Jesus. Right? The question I have for us this morning, have you been with Jesus? People will know. Uh, They won't necessarily be impressed with your accolades and your degrees and all of those other things. None of those things matter. Peter and John had never been to school. They'd never been to seminary. They didn't have the letters after their names or whatever. They didn't have any of that. What they had been was with Jesus and the effect of that presence in their lives had worn off. Notice verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, that they had nothing to say in opposition. When they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Word is spreading across the city. Do you see that? The entire city knows what happened. We can't deny that the miracle happened. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they're just going to breathe this toothless threat. Stop talking about Jesus. Okay, 
Verse 18, so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter and John remained humbly submissive until it was time to stop being submissive. At some point, they said, you know what? We will obey as far as we can. There is a line that we will not cross. And we can say the same. Pass your laws. We will obey as far as we can. But there will come a point when we will be forced to decide between the laws of men and the commands of God. And listen, church family, if they are going to force us to make that decision then we must be very clear about where we stand and with whom. Don't be offended. They're only treating you that way because they hate you. <laughs> but don't forget they hated Jesus first. Adopt the attitude of anywhere, anyone, anytime. Lord, I'm just going to go limp. Have your way. Put me wherever people need to hear the truth and rely upon the, the spirit of God for what to say. He is not going to lead you into a situation and then leave you there. Where he guides, we know he also provides. Preach the truth regardless of the consequences and refuse to stop. And honestly, church, if you do, people will know that you've been with Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word which speaks so clearly in God. Would you give us the grace that Peter and John had on that day? Would you give us the courage that Peter and John had on that day to boldly proclaim the truth in Jesus' name? Amen.